Well, let's get underway. Uh, it's a, a real delight to me to see so many of you here. Uh, I, I really think that Jewish philosophy is a very important project. Uh, it's had a checkered career in, in uh, Jewish cultural history. Uh, uh, like all of our history, it stops and starts and gets restarted again and rediscovered. Uh, look at the book of Deuteronomy. Look at the way they dug out the, the, the ideas of the law from uh, the cornerstone of the old temple and had to figure out what it meant. And you can see, even in the Torah, that kind of archaeology of the old ideas being rediscovered and, 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 and reconceptualized. Uh, and that certainly has happened with Jewish philosophy. Uh, we have a group that... Uh, is called the Academy for Jewish Philosophy, and one of the things we try to do is to reinvigorate Jewish philosophy in the 21st century. Uh, we have a session every year at the uh, American uh, Philosophical Association and another one at the Association for Jewish Studies and another one at the uh, American Academy of Religion, and, uh, and we try to uh, empower Jewish thinkers to stop thinking in a strictly historical and descriptive way and to, and to actually engage in doing Jewish philosophy. And that's certainly one of the many projects that the Rambam was engaged in. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted that, that, that you're motivated to be here, uh, as I am, uh, to, in, to engage in that kind of discourse and to, and to study its, its, its roots and branches. Um, last time we, uh, we talked about the, the life and times of the Rambam. Rabbi? Doctor? Oh, okay, so then you have to sit over there. Uh, Nehemiah is our youngest Jewish philosopher. Uh, we, uh, we were talking about the life and times of the Rambam, how he was born in Cordova, had to leave in childhood, uh, made his way to North Africa with his family. He was still a kid at the time started doing work in, in Jewish law, uh, eventually wound up after a, a, a brief uh, and very moving uh, but ultimately unsuccessful stay in the land of Israel, wound up in Egypt uh, as a court physician and advisor uh, in, the, in the time in the court of uh, the famous uh, Kurdish Sunni uh, Muslim uh, ruler Saladin. Uh, ran a thriving medical practice in order to support his family, um, wrote ten medical books, three major works of Jewish law, including what is uh, one of the most authoritative codes of Jewish law, that 14-volume work over there that I pointed to last time. And what is probably the, uh, the most penetrating uh, excursion yet into Jewish philosophy by a committed Jew. Uh, certainly the greatest of the Jewish philosophers was Spinoza, but, uh, but he had a, a kind of rupture with the Jewish community, which was uh, a, a great loss uh, not only to, uh, uh, to him, but to the Jewish community as well. Um, but but of, the, of the thinkers who have been committed to, to, their, to their Judaism, who, who, who wanted to make sense of the, of the Torah and its mitzvot, who, who uh, believed that the uh, divine creation, divine revelation, divine uh, governance of the world was the uh, underlying principle of Judaism. Certainly Rambam was the, the greatest of those philosophers. And we're going to plunge in today uh, into um, the, the beginnings of the Guide to the Perplexed, the, the great philosophical work that he wrote in the 12th century, uh, towards the end of the 12th century, um, trying to um, explain for the benefit, a seat up here, seat up here, trying to benefit, trying to explain for the benefit of a, uh, a, a well-educated but puzzled person um, how the, the strange and seemingly primitive ideas of the Torah could be reconciled with the uh, also strange but seemingly very advanced and scientific and philosophically sophisticated ideas of the Aristotelian philosophers and the Neoplatonic tradition of Aristotelian philosophy that had been brought to a high pitch of scientific and logical rigor by the, uh, by the Muslim thinkers in particular in, in whose environment he lived and by a few great Jewish predecessors like Saja Gaon, the 10th century um, 
scholar of Bible, of grammar, of, of uh, lexicography, uh, uh, and, and a few others. Uh, in the Guide to the Perplexed, it's written in a very strange sort of way. And uh, I, I'm sure when you read the Guide to the Perplexed, uh, one of the things that happens to people when they read to the, guide to the Guide to the Perplexed is they, they get the idea, this is a book that's supposed to help unperplex you, and you, and you wind up getting more perplexed as, as you read it. And the first question you ask yourself, and it's a very legitimate and important question to ask, is what is this book about? Uh, I used to have a, a, a science teacher, a wonderful, uh, Thomistically educated uh, uh, general science teacher when I was in seventh grade, and he always used to give us a weekly test every Friday. And the first question on every one of those tests was, what is the subject matter of this test? Could be electricity, could be weather, could be changes of state and matter, but you had to know what the subject matter. What's the subject matter of the Guide to the Perplexed? And what's the subject matter of the opening parts of it in particular? It seems as though it were intended to be mystifying. And uh, in a way, it is. Uh, when Maimonides started to write this book, uh, he was facing a certain problem. And this is the problem. The subject matter that he wanted to write about uh, was a subject matter that he identified with something that was described in the Talmud, in Hagiga, in the Talmud, as being restricted. It had to do with two passages. They described it in terms of two passages in the Talmud. One was Maase Bereshit. Maase Bereshit means the account of creation. Bereshit is the first word in the Torah, as you know, in the beginning. And the story of in the beginning, according to the rabbis in the Talmud, was something that you shouldn't teach in public. You shouldn't publish about it. You shouldn't teach lectures about it. Um, the, other, the other topic, which the rabbis restricted and, 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 and forbade people, really, to, to teach about it in public, was Maase Merkava. That's a little bit more obscure. Everyone knows about the account of creation, uh, although not everyone knows quite what to say about it, but everyone knows that it's there. It's the first thing you read in the Torah. Um, what's the chariot, Maase Merkava, the account of the chariot? That, of course, refers, if you know your Negro spirituals, that refers to the vision of Ezekiel where Ezekiel saw this chariot coming down out of the sky and there were these strange beings in it that were sort of humanoid and sort of animal-like and they had multiple faces and they, they moved without bending their limbs and they were very strange creatures in this, in this vision that Ezekiel had. Why did the rabbis restrict public teaching about those two matters? Well. The, it's, it's easier to see why they restricted the, the teaching about uh, Masse Merkava, the account of the chariot. Because in that account, Ezekiel says something uh, very blatant, more blatant than any other prophetic writing would ever say. He says that he actually saw a vision of the likeness of the glory. He, he, he uses a little periphrasis. He st steps back from it a little bit. But he seems to be saying that he saw God. And we don't believe that God is something that you can see. So what the heck is going on here? And the rabbis say, don't explain that in public. All right? Which is not very helpful. It sounds a little obscurantist. I mean, sort of paradigmatically obscurantist, right? The problem would be, how does God, who is infinite and universal and spiritual, manifest himself in a, in, a, in a way that could relate at all to anything that is finite. How is God, who is non-physical, capable of judging and governing and ruling and directing the affairs of things that are physical? That's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. And, you, and it's epitomized, in a way, in that story about the chariot, because here's the idea. It, it, it's, not some, it's not some vision of some, some uh, pagan deity that appears. That's easy. Pagan deities, you know, when you see them, they look just like humans, except they're bigger and they glow a little, right? Uh, but, but, but the absolute God, how does that, 
scale itself down in some way to appear on a level that, 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 that we could apprehend. And we have within the Torah all kinds of things that would suggest to us that that's not possible. Like when God says to Moses, thou canst not see my face, for man shall not see my face and live. It's too much, it would overwhelm us. And yet, here's Ezekiel, what chutzpah, to say that he has, you know, I mean, he's careful about the way he says it, but in the end he, he says he saw God. All right, that's the first problem. And the problem about creation you can understand in relation to that. Because the problem about creation is, is an analogous problem, isn't it? How could, how could God, who is transcendent, relate to a world that is, that is here, that is physical, that is, that is so limited in so many ways? How could, how could God uh, uh, be responsible for that? How does God govern it? Um, Think about the difference in scale between the infinite and the finite. Think about the problems, which were very vexed problems, highly debated among the Muslim philosophers of Maimonides' own time, about how does God, who is timeless, relate to something which is temporal? So that even the notion of creation would be conceivable. Because many of those Aristotelian philosophers believed that there was a logical disconnect between the timeless and, and the temporal, which made creation, they argued, impossible. And again, the rabbis uh, don't seem to be very helpful in the Talmud when they say, okay, somebody wants to study that, um, don't teach about that in public. Now notice, notice that they didn't say it's forbidden to teach about it. The rabbis were never that categorical with that kind of matter. They said as they so often do, there's a way around it. And the way around it is to teach these matters one-on-one -on -one with students who are properly prepared. <coughs> and when you teach that way, how will you know if the students are properly prepared? Give them little hints of the answers, but don't open up the questions for them. Because if you open up the questions for them, they're going to wind up with more problems than, you know, they might not be able to handle, right? But if they've been pondering these questions for themselves and you give them the little hints, they'll say, aha, now I see, and it fits all together because they've been worrying about this and they'll see how the answers fit together with the questions. That way, you don't have the, the, the problem of making people's intellectual difficulties about our religion more difficult for them, and you address yourself very selectively to those who are capable of dealing with those problems and who in fact need to deal with those problems because they've already been vexed by them. Those are the people that the Rambam is trying to address in the Guide to the Perplexed. And he writes it, now you can understand why he writes it in the form he does. There are two traditional forms that he might have used. One is a treatise form, it's organized First, I'm going to deal with this subject, and then I'm going to deal with that subject, and it's all classified and categorized. We know that Saja, for example, back in the 10th century, wrote in that form, was a pioneer of that form. Maimonides could have written in that form. In his legal code, he organized and categorized. There's nothing, I mentioned last time, nothing better organized than the Mishneh Torah, the great code of law. It's not that this man is a sloppy and digressive sort of thinker, but that would have meant laying it all out. Writing a treatise would have been violating the rabbinic command in the letter and in the spirit. Because a treatise, even though it's copied by hand, is published. And a treatise, even though it requires some skill to read it, is uh, accessible to anybody who follows the logic of the layout of it. And that's not the audience the Rambam wants to address. The other traditional form that he could have used was a commentary. He could have gone step by step, and he could have uh, explained the way you see in, in, in Rashi, or he would have seen in Saja, writing a commentary, maybe with an introduction, thematically organizing the big concepts of the work, and then, and then going through uh, the Torah. Now we know that Maimonides could write commentaries. He wrote a commentary on the Mishnah. And Saja wrote commentaries at length. It was his favored way of, of, of writing. But Maimonides doesn't write a commentary either. And the reason he doesn't write a commentary, I think, is that he does want to address problems. He does want to problematize 
the text. He doesn't want to bury those problems in uh, systematically going through, here's what this verse says and here's what that verse means. He doesn't want to subordinate his philosophical thinking to the material of the tradition. And so he writes a kind of a hybrid which goes back and forth between the mode of treatise and the mode of commentary, but doesn't adopt the organizational plan of either. So what organizational plan does he use? He uses a plan that was devised in antiquity and developed to a high pitch by his Arab predecessors, the essay form. Now you may have learned in college that the essay form came into provenance with uh, Montaigne or Bacon. But I can show you essays that were written in the 10th century. I can show you essays that were written in the 9th century. And if you listen to, 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 the, the, to the way those things are written, you'll see that the essay form evolved out of the letter form. What's the difference between an essay and a treatise? An essay is more intimate. An essay has an direct addressee, and the author will often say, my dear reader, you will understand these things. The essay evolves out of the letter. And Arabic prose evolves out of the letter form, too. The Arabs were great poets, and they had a marvelous poetry long before Islam. But Arabic prose develops in administrative circles, where people were in the habit of writing letters, as we write memos for administrative purposes. And the literary people who wrote those letters uh, loved to read intimately written books. I translated one of them uh, from the 10th century, uh, uh, the case of the animals versus man. And every now and then it turns around and addresses the reader because it's talking to a very particular class of people. Why is that important to the Rambam? Because he actually writes the Guide to the Perplexed in the form of a letter addressed to a particular student. And he can trade upon the fact that he knows that student's reading he knows that student's background. He knows his knowledge. He knows what that student has worried about. He knows what that student won't be worried about and won't be troubled by at all. He can tailor it exactly that way. And then he takes up that piece of advice that he gets from reading very carefully and very charitably what he finds in the Talmud. He doesn't consider it obscurantist. He considers it good coaching about how he should be writing. Don't state the problems up front. If you're writing a treatise, you do like Sadia did and say, first I'm going to talk about creation, then I'm going to talk about the existence of God, then I'm going to talk about right and wrong. You know, you lay out each problem. How do we know that there's any such thing as knowledge? That's the first problem Sadia deals with in his introductory treatise to uh, the book of Critically Selected Beliefs and Convictions. Don't state the problems because our objective here is not to make more problems than we find. Dive right in, in medias res, give the people some ideas which will enable them to grasp, if they've worried about these things, they'll see how to deal with this issue and that issue and the other issue. Was Maimonides successful with that technique? Is it really possible to select your own audience in that way and keep people away? Al-Ghazali, his predecessor among the Muslim theologians, wrote a book which is called The Book to be Kept Away from People Who Are Not Fit to Understand It. <laughs> and you know that's the first thing everybody's going to pull down off the shelf, right? Was Maimonides really successful in, in selecting his audience that way? I submit to you that he was, because I've lectured around the country and in Europe and other places about Maimonides, and I have talked with people and listened to people and read papers by people who are professional specialists in Maimonides, and a great many of them have no idea what the subject matter of part one of the Guide to the Perplexed is. <laughs> He's that successful. They think that the book, part one, I, I have to be careful here, you know, because he doesn't call it a book. That's one of the ways he tips his hand, that he's listening to what the rabbi said. He never calls it a book. He calls it a study, he calls it a compilation, and he writes it in the form of a letter. It's a very long letter, but very tailored. Part one, they think it's about anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is the representation of God in human terms. Anthropos is man, morphe is, is, is form. Representation of God in human terms. Sometimes you hear about in ethology, too. They talk about representing animals in human terms, right? The, the cat wants to play, that sort of thing. Um, 
Anthropomorphism is the representation of God in human terms. And it's certainly clear that, that those opening sections of the Guide to the Perplexed do talk about anthropomorphism. But if you do philosophy, I'll tell you the first thing you need to know about philosophy, and one of the most basic and one of the easiest to forget. You always have to know in philosophy what's being assumed and what the person's trying to prove. And if you look at the Guide to the Perplexed that way, you find out that when he's talking about anthropomorphism, he consistently assumes that it's false. He never tries to prove that you shouldn't talk about God in human terms. He says it's been demonstrated. Everyone knows that. The question is, if you're not supposed to talk about God in human terms, what the devil is going on in the Torah, which constantly talks about God in human terms. It says, you know, it says, Vayichara po. You know what Vayichara po means? It, 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 in, in the King james sort of English, it comes out that he waxed wroth. But in Hebrew, what it says is, his nose was on fire. All right? That's the kind of anthropomorphism you've got in the Torah. The Torah says, when the Torah wants to say that God was angry, it says his, his nose was kindled. That's pretty heavy anthropomorphism, right? When it wants to say that God uh, uh, appreciates a sacrifice, it says that he, he, he smelled the sweet savor of it. All right? That's pretty anthropomorphic, you've got to admit. So the question, the problem is not, not, not how do we prove that anthropomorphism is wrong, but how do we reconcile the anthropomorphism that we find in the Torah with our knowledge that anthropomorphism is wrong? That's the beginning of the, of the problematic that the Rambam wants to attack in the beginning of the Guide to the Perplexed. And you can see how that fits into the general scheme of addressing questions about the interface, if you will, between divine transcendence and divine immanence, between, between uh, 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 God as the infinite and God as the creator, between God as the utterly transcendent and God who reveals himself, between God who uh, is perfectly good and God who creates a world in which bad things happen. All these kinds of problems. The Rambam sums up those two kinds of problems under two traditional headings, the headings of Maase Merkava and Maase, Maase Bereshit, but he identifies them with two disciplines of philosophy. Maase Bereshit, he identifies as physics. What does he mean by physics? Well, first of all, you have to know that in Aristotelian philosophy, physics means the whole study of nature. And what he means by physics is the study of nature from a sort of grand cosmological perspective with particular reference to the theological issues about it. Right? That is, how does the infinite God relate to the finite world? Right? Cosmology in that kind of sense. Not physics in general, like the way Newton or, or, or some ancient study of, of physics would do it. But that theological problem about physics. The second one he calls metaphysics, which in Aristotelian parlance, you know Aristotle didn't use the word metaphysics. In Aristotelian par parlance, you know what metaphysics is called? Theology. That's the problem about the Merkava. He identifies that with theology. Not everyone who reads the Talmud identifies it that way, but the Rambam does. And theology, again, looked at from the point of view of the problem of revelation and looked at from the point of view of that problem about the interface between the infinite and the finite, a subsection of which is the problem of evil, right? Because, because if God is infinite and the world is finite, we have deficiency here, we have lack, we have, we have vulnerability. And he's going to be dealing with the problem of evil later on in the book, right? He's going to, he's going to address the question. He's going to look at the book of Job. He's going to uh, address the question of, of uh, divine governance, which is the general rubric under which the problem of evil lies, right? If God has power and God is good and, and God knows what's going on, why do these terrible things happen? And I want you to know, you know, it didn't start with Auschwitz. Auschwitz, Auschwitz is, is, is a horrible, horrible um, complex of events. But the same problem on a different scale was faced by the Jews in 1492 when they were expelled from Spain. It was faced many, many times before. It was faced at the destruction of the temple, and it was faced in the book of Job as a general issue about human beings. And you know, uh, uh, the book of Job is, is in some ways more universal than some of what our Holocaust people write because, because Job isn't even supposed to be a Jew. It's about human suffering. This is a man who was a good man and he suffered and he didn't deserve it and why could that be? And how did God allow it? 
That's the general issue. All right? And that comes under the heading, which he uses the, the Talmudic catchphrase, Maaseh Merkava, the, uh, the account of the chariot. All right? Because God ought to be revealing himself here in, in, in a more concrete way. Well, let's look at some of these anthropomorphisms, because he does a very interesting kind of series of moves here. He starts out with, with two of the most prominent and most interesting, and he has a particular reason for giving them pride of place. He starts out with Selim and Demut. Selim and Demut in Hebrew means image and likeness. It says in Bereshit that God created man in his own image and likeness, male and female. Well, obviously, if it's male and female in his own image and likeness, the reference is not to something physical. The Rambam uses a technique here. It's a technique which he could certainly find in Saja. It's a technique which was developed to a high pitch by the Arab uh, grammarians and lexicographers. Um, he surveys the usage of those terms in other parts of the Bible, and he sees what the range of possible meanings of them is. And uh, what he finds, he finds that the word toar, for example, which is a word for liniments or, or physiognomy or form in general, that is always used with a physical sense. And he gives you a, a text he learns from Sadia, you have to quote, and the Talmud, they do this too, a proof text. Uh, it says about Joseph, he was Yefet Toar, he was a fair of form. He was a nice looking guy. And that's the way the word Toar is used. Um, Tavnit, never applied to God. Tavnit comes from the root Bana, which means to build, it means a construction. God is not constructed. So that word is never applied to God. But image and likeness are applied to God. And what does he find about them? He finds that uh, these have multiple senses, that sometimes they have a physical meaning, and sometimes they refer to the imagination. The imagination in medieval psychology and epistemology is the, is the faculty in between concept and, and sensation. All right? It's where you picture something or, or imagine something. Uh, it doesn't mean creativity in those days. That was a, a, uh, an 18th century sense that was given to it later. Imagination uh, could be the way. Or it could be conceptual. It could be purely conceptual and not physical at all. And again, he has a proof text for that. Because uh, in, the, in the Psalms, the psalmist is, one of the Psalms, very depressed. It's a, it's a psalm about, uh, they think now it's about the destruction of the temple. And, um, and the psalmist says, I am like unto a pelican in the desert. I'm like unto a pelican in the desert. And Maimonides loves that, you see, because it's going to help him prove his point. He says he doesn't mean that he has feathers like a pelican. He doesn't mean he looks like a pelican. He means like he feels like a pelican would feel if it were in the desert. Because pelicans don't belong in the desert. They belong by the sea, <coughs> right? But if a pelican were in the desert, that's how desolated I feel, the psalmist says. And that's a spiritual connection. That's a structural resemblance. There's nothing about a picture in it. Not of the senses, not of the imagination. It's a purely conceptual, moral, intellectual, spiritual relationship. Similarly, he argues, when you look at the word see, the word see, and you see this in English too, it could be physical, right? It could be perceptual seeing, or it could be intellectual kind of seeing when somebody explains something to you and you say, oh yes, I see. And he finds that attested in the Torah, where it says, my heart has seen wisdom. My heart has seen wisdom. Wisdom is not the kind of thing you see with your eyes. Wisdom is the kind of thing you understand. And the heart, of course, biblically is the seat of the understanding. Again, used metaphorically. Right? My heart, because his heart doesn't see with the eyes. My heart has seen wisdom. And he says whenever the word see is applied to God, either as the subject of seeing or as the object of seeing, it's that intellectual understanding that, that is meant. And he's got a proof text for that. You know where? Well, you've read it. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. How do you see that something's good? It's not, it's, it's not uh, you know, so, something visual. But when God created again and again, God saw that it was good. So he's got his intellectual sense there. And notice the way he's setting up a progression from the physical to the imaginative to the intellectual. 
okay? And whichever one is the highest step on that progression, the closest to the intellectual, that's the one that applies to God. He's beginning to give you a method for analyzing the anthropomorphisms in the Torah. What's it getting at? What's it pointing to? Using that kind of vocabulary, he's now ready to draw a kind of corollary. If it were a treatise or a geometrical thing, it would be a corollary. He points out that Aristotle says that if you're going to study metaphysics, you should be very humble. And you shouldn't be overconfident in your ability to understand anything. Remember, metaphysics is theology here. You shouldn't be overconfident of your ability to understand, but you should, you sh- you should, you should check yourself and rein yourself in and, and, and be cautious about what you, what you claim and be, be patient about um, uh, going too far, too fast. And that's a way of kind of moralizing the advice of the sages about do this one-on-one and don't rush ahead of yourself, right? And he sets up a contrast here with the kind of people who have the right kind of philosophical insight, who proceed slowly and carefully and don't outrun their own human capabilities, which are very limited. And the people that he thinks are typified by the nobles of the children of Israel, who, when God revealed himself at Mount Sinai, ran ahead and, and rushed up. They were going to rush up that mountain if they could. They, were, they, were, you know, they had the barriers up that said, you know, not to cross. But, um, and what did they see? They saw the likeness of um, a, a floor of sapphire. Well, it sounds very spectacular. And it's the same language that's actually used about the, uh, the vision of Ezekiel. And that's important to the Rambam. All right? The same language about the floor of sapphire. But Maimonides thinks, Brian, come on in here. You've got plenty of chairs. The Rambam thinks that what they had was a disappointing thing because they got a substitution. They wanted to see God. And by golly, they got to see God, all right? They saw this, this glowing whiteness which looked like a jewel, Right? They were fobbed off with something lesser than the real thing because they were impatient. They rushed it. They ran up that slope. They tried to see something that they weren't ready for, that they didn't have the intellectual capacity to grasp, and they were, in effect, disappointed. And the Rambam will argue, as the book unfolds, he doesn't do it here because he's not doing a treatise, but he will argue that Ezekiel, in a way, suffered the same disappointment. I'll tell you about that a little. Eh, maybe I'll tell you about that now. I should explain I'm not violating the Talmudic prohibition. And you know why? Because for us in our generation, we've all got the problems. What we don't have is the answers. In those days, it was the other way around. Uh, all right? In those days, they had the answers. They just didn't know the questions. Uh, Maimonides makes a very interesting comparison between Ezekiel and Isaiah. It's later on in the book, and you'll come to it. But I, but I want to point out that he's preparing the ground for it right here. Ezekiel and Isaiah had the same vision. They both had the holy, holy, holy. They both saw the, the, the angels and, and all of that stuff. But he says, you know, Ezekiel was like a man from the country who is not used to the affairs of the city who has never been in the capital before. Isaiah was like an urbane man who has been around. And what's the difference? If the two men see the king, the man from the country will say, ah, there's the king. I can tell because of the, the, the standards flying over his head and all the men with swords standing around him. And he looks at the panoply. He looks at the display. He hears the trumpets blaring, and he knows in the middle of all that, that's the king. What he sees is the externals. What does the man from the city say? We've all all seen this. He says, see that guy there to the right of the king? He's the guy that does the the PR. And that guy over there, he's the one, he's the prime minister. He's He's the idea guy. He knows all the relationships, you see. This is the person, he's not looking at the the display. He's not looking at the pomp and circumstance. He's looking at the unseen relationships. He's understanding with the mind's eye. 
And that's the way it is with Isaiah and Ezekiel. They both have the same vision because they're both looking at the same God. But Ezekiel understands it in sensory terms. He represents a lower level of prophecy than Isaiah, who is able to comprehend the realities in more spiritual terms. All right? That... That's a little foretaste of things to come. But he gives you a, f a forecast of it right here where he talks about that uh, patience and impatience. And, of course, the epitome of the prophets is Moses. Moses was very humble. Humility goes with patience. What did Moses do when, when God revealed himself to Moses? He hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. That's what the text says. All right? as opposed to the elders, his contemporaries, who rushed ahead and were eager to see, over-eager, over-anxious, and necessarily deprived. He goes on to another term then. And the term he uses is makom. Makom is an interesting term. Uh, makom, as you know, means place. Literally, standing place. Uh, standing place, a place, lakum, to stand, right? Uh, Makom, we know it's actually one of the names for God in the Talmud. They like to call, you know, in the Haggadah, it says, Baruch HaMakom, blessed be the all-inclusive. We call God the place. Um, but, again, he, he sees a, a, a set, a, a sort of graded set of meanings of the term Makom. First of all, it could be physical. And then it could be social. He filled the, fa the place of his fathers in wisdom. Or... He had a certain place in society, meaning a certain rank. Uh, it could be moral, and ultimately it could be intellectual. It could represent, since it involves standing, it could represent the idea of stability and permanence. And he uses that idea when he talks about standing. Standing represents stability and purpose and per permanence. He goes on and he talks about Alo and Yarod, to rise and to, uh, and to fall. And, of course, he's going to say that these don't properly apply to God, that they have to do with the manifestation of God to us. God is constant. That's what Makom teaches us. But we vary a lot. And we're sometimes more capable, sometimes less capable of being in an intimate relation with God. Rabbi Merninger likes to tell us about the opportunities that we have through prayer to, to enter into a closer relationship with God. God is always there, but sometimes appears to us. And that variation is, is a result of what's happening in us and to us. Uh, that's how the Rambam glosses these terms of uh, rising and falling. Uh, that, are, that are applied biblically to God. Similarly with sitting. Sitting could be used in a physical sense. For example, when it says, Eli the priest was sitting in his chair, and we know what happened. He was leaning back too much and he fell over and, and, and he broke his neck. Um, that's sitting in the, in the physical sense. But sitting could also indicate stability. And we have examples um, uh, when it says that Jerusalem will sit forever, meaning it will endure forever. Right? It's a political promise there. It's talking about political stability. And then it says, God sits at the flood. Why sitting? Why sitting at the flood? Because the flood represents turmoil and chaos. And God sits at the flood represents God's stability, God's permanence, God's changelessness. Similarly with standing. God was standing at the top of the ladder when Jacob saw the ladder in his dream. God was standing at the... Does that mean God has feet and stands up? No, no, no. It, it means the same thing as sitting, actually. It has to do with stability and permanence. It has to do with the idea of God's absoluteness, in other words. Notice something that's going on here. The anthropomorphic language of the Torah is being used in a very systematic way and is being interpreted in a very systematic way as a way of indicating certain ontic values, certain very abstract ideas, which are, Rambam later points out, never conveyed in abstract terms. The Torah brilliantly uses ordinary human language to convey very abstruse ideas without relying on the kind of abstract, you know, I'm glossing it for you in terms of transcendence, permanence, these are all abstract terms. The Torah doesn't use those terms. The Torah uses ordinary human language that's accessible to anybody although you have to be careful 
not to take those terms in their ordinary human senses. God is called a rock, so he chooses to talk about the term rock. Again, it has a physical sense. And metaphorically, it could mean the source or basis of something. There's a wonderful line in Isaiah 51, look to the rock whence you were hewn. Right? Referring, and we know in that case that it's referring to Abraham and to Sarah. I'll give you the quote exactly. Rabbi Merdinger's looking at me because I didn't quote it word for word. Uh, <laughs> uh, look to the rock whence you were hewn. Look, uh, look to the quarry you were dug from. And then because Hebrew poetry is based on symmetry and, and uh, uh, parallelism, it actually glosses itself. It says, look to Abraham, your father, to Sarah, who bore you. For he was only one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. Isaiah referring back to Abraham, Abraham as the source of his people, and therefore called the rock in the sense of the quarry. And you know it's the quarry because he says the rock from which you were hewn. And he makes the parallel with Sarah, all right, who's also called a quarry in that same verse, right? So you've got, you've got the thing actually glossed for you, and you've got this idea of rock as source. And then he says, when God is called a rock, well, you know what that means already, uh, a source of strength, a source of stability. You're beginning to see you could, you could do it yourself, and that's what he wants you to be able to do, to see how all this language is used very systematically to give you an idea. And of course, if you say, if you, if you quetch and you say, well, they all seem to mean the same thing. All these colorful terms seem to mean the same thing. Well, shouldn't they? <laughs> if they're all referring to God, shouldn't they all mean the same thing? Uh, how, many, how many gods are we wanting here? Uh, uh, they all are going to mean the same thing. There are different ways of getting at the same idea, which is the idea of God's absoluteness and God's perfection and God's strength and God's permanence. To approach or come near. He glosses these in the same way, of course. A physical sense and a, a spiritual, intellectual sense. And he says an interesting remark. This is one of the places where he addresses his reader, right? Because it is an essay written in letter form. He says, I don't see you falling into doubt or confusion over the words that the Lord is near to those who call upon him. All right? That doesn't seem to bother you. We say that all the time in our prayers. Right? It's from the 145th Psalm. The Lord, Lord is near to those who call upon him. We know that that means spiritual nearness, right? It doesn't mean... And then he, he, he drives the point home. He says, you know, it, uh, remember they have the spheres circling the earth. He says, it doesn't matter if you're in the outermost sphere or, or right here on earth. That doesn't get you any closer or any further to God. It, it, it has to do with God's immediacy. There's Goodman again using an abstract term to explain something very concrete. All right? But that's what it's getting at in its very concrete biblical style. To fill. Could be taken physically, as when Rebecca filled up her well, her, her, her jug at the well. His proof text. Or it could mean the completion of a time span. That's more figurative, right? His days were filled. He was full of, Ab Abraham uh, you know, died full of years, that sort of thing. Um, And then we have the ability to interpret a line, one of the most beautiful lines in the Torah from Isaiah 6.3. Melokol ha'aretz kavodo. Literally, the fill of all the earth is his glory. Ibn Ezra says it should be understood to mean the whole earth is full of his glory. But literally it says the fill of all the earth is his glory. What does it mean? The Rambam says that it, that it means that God manifests himself throughout creation. And then he says something kind of pluralistic and tolerant. He says, well, if you want to understand the glory as a kind of created light by which God manifests himself, that's okay. That's a little tip of the hat to Saja because that was the way Saja understood verses like that. Okay? He says, that's okay. But if you want to know what it means, what it actually means is that God manifests himself throughout creation. It's not, it's not just... Uh, some kind of spectacular light show that's put on on special occasions. Because after all, Isaiah wasn't talking about a special occasion when the, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle or something like that. He's talking about Malokal Haaretz Kavodo all the time, right? The whole earth 
is full of his glory, or the fill of all the earth is his glory. Why does he say it's okay to take Sadia's approach? Well, because you're not then making the mistake of thinking that God is something that actually occupies this space or that space, as if the glory were standing in for God. You know that that was just the same thing and, and God was some kind of a, a physical aura. That would be the mistake. That would be not okay. Now, he does an important one with pass. And obviously, you know the pattern by now. Uh, pass could mean to, um, you know, physically pass something. But he, but he does an interesting thing with this one. He says it could mean to bypass, as when you overshoot, okay? Or when, you, when you, uh, you're, you're, you're going for a certain goal and you, and you go beyond it. Why does he mention that one? That one is very important to him because the word pass is used in connection with Moses' epiphany when Moses sees God and God passes before his face. We read it on holidays in Yom Kippur, right? When the, we, we recite the 13 uh, attributes of God and, and so forth. This is the, the epiphany of God to, to Moses and uh, he says, this is artful now, He says, Moses made two requests to God. One was that he wanted to see God's face. See his back. Whatever the heck that means. And of course, you know by now that Maimonides is going to explain that term. And the way he explains it, as I say, is very artful. What he says is this. The word achor in Hebrew could mean the back, like like that back, you know, the front and the back. Uh, It could mean uh, what comes after because the front is called the face and the, and the back is called what comes after. Uh, or it could mean what follows from something or what, what, the, the wake of something. All right? And that's the way he thinks it's meant when it says that God let Moses see his back. The reference, he says, is to the effects of God in the world which is metaphorically called his back because that's what comes after God. You're not going to see God's front, which would be to capture God's identity and comprehend it and have, have the infinite within your own finite self. That's never going to happen. But you can apprehend God through nature. And that's what Moses did in a consummate way. Moses wanted to know, if you look at the context of the passage, Moses wanted to know God so that he could know how to govern the people. That's his very precise request. He says, he says, let me see your face so that I will know how to rule these people. You want me to rule these people? This is how I'm going to do it. What he needs to know for that purpose is not God's self-sameness. What he needs to know for that purpose is how God governs the world. And that is, he needs to understand God's effects in and through and on creation. And that's what he is vouchsafed to know. And that's what's referred to as knowing God's or seeing God's back. That's the metaphorical language as, as the Rambam unpacks it. He not only dissolves the anthropomorphism, but he gets something very important out of it, which is, which is a, a, a positive kind of way that we can have of apprehending God through the study of nature. Remember now that the Rambam is a physician. And he is part of that tradition in medicine which believes that you can understand uh, God's wisdom through studying uh, the, the intricacies and the, and, and the beauties of design in the human body, right? So, so that would be part of the... Now, now of course, Moses didn't dissect anybody the, 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 way, the way a physician might dissect an animal or, or a cadaver or something like that. But Moses uh, had this kind of comprehensive, intuitive understanding of nature. That's what the epiphany of God to him was. And that's the comprehensiveness of it was what enabled the Torah to say that Moses talked with God face to face. Not that he could see God's face because it says that he couldn't, but that he could have that kind of converse with with God that he would understand God's governance of nature so well that he would see how that would apply in law, how that would ordain a set of principles that people could be governed by. 
And that's why when you go on and see what actually the words that are said when God passes before Moses, that is, withholds the face but gives him the back, what are the words that are said? Hashem, Hashem, El Rachum V'chanun, Erech HaPayim, V'Rav Chesed V'Emet. Lord, Lord, merciful and compassionate. Right? Preserving kindness for generations. For thousands. Right? That, those principles of, of justice and mercy, which is what Moses really needed to know, are the principles by which God governs nature and from which Moses could learn how the law should be directed and aimed. What its, what its thematics would have to be. What about to go? Once again, there's a physical sense and there's an intellectual sense. As in, Torah, his proof text, right? For out of Zion shall go the Torah. The Torah doesn't go out of Zion by way of traveling. It goes out of Zion by way of understanding, right? And it's an intellectual movement, not a physical one. Similarly, uh, words about departing. And here he again uh, finds something very powerful, the loss of God's presence. The loss of God's presence. And he points out here, and this is going to be very important for what he has to say later about the problem of evil. The loss of God's presence, he says, entails a loss of providence. If God isn't with you, then you're not being cared for by God. That, he says, when it says, uh, uh, that loss, he says, is a terrible threat indeed. And he quotes a proof text to prove it. His text, I shall hide my face from them and they shall be devoured. So the absence of God, the loss of God, is tantamount to destruction. The loss of God's presence is the loss of providence. And that will be explained later on. He's not going to take that in a kind of superstitious way. You could already see that he wouldn't do that. Uh, it hasn't been explained yet, but he's laid the groundwork for it here when he's, when he's laying out this kind of glossary of biblical anthropomorphisms. He finds a, 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 a famous sentence in the Talmud, and he stops and expatiates on that for a moment. And the sentence in the Talmud is, Adam. The Torah speaks in keeping with Hebrew... With, with, the Torah, I'm sorry. The Torah speaks in keeping with human language. The Torah speaks in keeping with human language. Dibrat Torah kilashon b'nei adam. Now that's actually something in, in its context, which is applied to a particular verse that's being explained in the Talmud. But because of the fact that it's that exp- expressed in the in the in the present tense, there, he takes it as a general rule. The Torah always speaks in human language. And of course, you could ask yourself, what other language would it speak in? It wouldn't be very intelligible to us if it were speaking in some non-human language, if there were any. What does it mean when it says that the Torah speaks in human language? It means that the Torah accommodates itself to our sensibilities. So it's very natural and very understandable that the Torah would use this kind of concrete language, this kind of anthropomorphic language to talk about something which can't really be apprehended in that way. Thus, applying that general rule, people generally equate physicality with existence. They think that if something is physical, it's real. If something is not physical, it's not real. And so the Torah talks about God as if he had a body in order to convince you not that God has a body, but that God exists. Because that's the way people think about existence. The to- people think of action in terms of motion. And so the Torah talks about God coming and going in order to give you the idea that God is active. What time do we have to stop? A minute. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, uh, we, have a, we have a floating uh, clock here. I, I, thought I, I thought I had till eight. Okay, I'm sorry. That was my mistake. Um, I, will, I will make two points in that minute. And these are the two points. One is about anger and jealousy, one of the most notorious points in the Torah's anthropomorphisms. Uh, Christians love to beat Jews over the head with that one, you know, the uh, Old Testament God, angry God, jealous, etc. 
According to Maimonides, jealousy refers to exclusivity. But anger, he surveys, is applied only to idolatry. And it has to do with the alienation between a person who doesn't recognize the right God. It's not that God has passions. God doesn't have passions. But someone who has a wrong idea of God has tragically distanced himself from God. And, that, and that is a, that, that's a very serious lack and that, c- that connects with that business about the, uh, the loss of, of God's presence. Uh, he wants to make the point in that regard that idolaters, he says they don't really believe that those clay figures are, are really God. They don't think that that's what created the world. They think that those are symbols of an intermediary to God. They're wrong because they're worshiping the wrong thing, but, 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 the, but they're not as bad, actually, as the people who, re- who misrepresent the real God. And we'll talk about that more next time. But my last point. He quotes a saying from the Talmud. The saying from the Talmud, great is the boldness of the prophets who liken the creature to the creator. Great is the boldness of the prophets who liken the creature to the creator. And from this he derives, he says, it's interesting that they use the word boldness because they use it in another place about somebody who performed the ritual of chalitza in the dark and alone, instead of doing it in public and, 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 and in the daytime. They call that, oh, that was bold. He must have been a very great rabbi to get away with that. Boldness in this case me- means a certain kind of poetic license. The poetic license, which enables one to use human language to describe something, someone, who is totally transcendent of all human categories. That's boldness. I would call it prophetic license. And that's what the Rambam thinks is going on here. He thinks it's brilliantly done, and he allows the Torah itself to deconstruct its own vocabulary and to reconstruct it on the orientation of letting you see God as the most permanent, the most perfect, the most spiritual, and at the same time, the nearest of all beings. I'll stop there. Okay, we'll have discussion and and questions and all that after... uh, Um, Yeah, after... Davening.